Sipilele Ngobese is a researcher at the South African Cities Network, and she's my guest today on Future Cities Africa. She's responsible for the Urban Safety Program, which looks at issues of urban informality, inclusivity of vulnerable sectors of society, and youth in city spaces. Welcome, Sipilele. Let's talk a bit more about your background and your current role at the South African Cities Network. Okay, hi Dan. Uh, thank you so much for having me on, on, your, on your show. So just by way of introduction, I'm Sipele Lingobese. Um, I've had, yeah, I've, I've had quite an evolution career-wise. So by training, I'm, I'm, I'm trained in uh, international relations and diplomacy, uh, which later revolved into work in the human rights sector, which is how I found myself um, doing work relating to planning, housing, because I was doing work related to issues around the progressive realization of the right to housing. So that I've, that's how I, I evolved and found myself in the planning world. And today um, I'm an urban planner um, in the research field, uh, responsible for SACN's inclusion and well-being program, under which the urban safety work falls. So it, 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 it's a broader intervention around um, supporting our cities and, 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 and providing knowledge around edging closer and closer to equal societies. So from exclusion to inclusion um, and tracking the progress of cities um, in that. And uh, urban safety, as you've explained, is indeed a broad area of work that, that calls for us to start to look at more than just policing, more than just law enforcement, and realizing and recognizing that it's, it's also about economy, it's also about space, and it's also about society. Can you perhaps then give a broader overview of the actual urban safety program, um, some of its key objectives, and okay. some of its major accomplishments to date? So I've, I know that you've done quite a few reports over the years, What's the implementation of those reports been like? How do you inspire people to take action on these suggested policies? So the Urban Safety Reference Group, we started in 2014. So SACN, as you might know, is an organization that has the eight largest metros in South Africa as its members or participating cities. One of our, what we do is that we facilitate, we, well, we collect intelligence, we analyze, we, we, we think about and we provide evidence around how cities can be better at what they do. We look at what they do in terms of productivity, inclusivity, how well governed they are, how they are financed and uh, environmental sustainability as well. So one of our key modalities of facilitating learning and exchange among the cities, because it is our belief and our conviction that uh, where some cities have knowledge on some things, they should cross-pollinate and share that with others. So reference groups are one of our key learning modalities and how we facilitate learning and exchange among our participating cities. And so that's how the Urban Safety Reference Group came about in 2014. We recognized that it was an issue that required that way of engaging because we have a myriad of other ways of engaging with cities and engaging within, within the space um, across spheres of government. So um, it's, it's a platform that brings together the urban safety or community safety or public safety practitioners with it. So different cities call it different things, but this field of practice that has to do um, with safety. Recognizing that the, the, the largest share of crime and violence um, in our country is concentrated in our urban, urban centers or our metros. Um, and wanting to define a more sustainable approach by cities and by the entire governance space um, that looks, as I said, beyond law enforcement, policing, and so on, and starts to engage with the, with, the, with the social, with the economic, and with the spatial. And so the way that space is, the built environment is a great, can be a great enabler or disabler um, of crime. Similarly, the way the economy is structured and similarly um, cultures and attitudes within our social spaces. And so we wanted our 
our objectives were to advocate around that as an agenda and to also say that if community safety or public safety or urban safety is a mandate that is handed down from national to the local level, but without the funding. So national will hand down and say, you are now responsible for this area of work, but not give the requisite funding. So cities have had to find in their already overstretched budgets, the money to drive uh, community safety programs. So how do you advocate and how do you bring attention to the need for there to be clear roles and responsibilities and funding for the work of, of, of community or public safety. And so we, we, we support cities in, in, in driving their agenda, in advocacy for, for, for more fiscal allocations, um, in, in advocating for cross-departmental and cross-sectoral collaboration on the issue of safety. There's a role for the planner. There's a role for the community development practitioner. There's a role for the economic development practitioner um, in, in, in safety. Even the transport infrastructure delivery has a lot, there's a lot to do with safety. Um, even before you deliver the infrastructure that will um, curb the problems you might encounter later that relate to issues of violence and crime. So what can you do in your planning beforehand to kind of, um, alleviate the issues that might arise later where then it will require a policing approach now the infrastructure is being stripped and then it becomes a law enforcement issue so what can you do in terms of thinking about the space in a way that can reduce the probability of crime and violence so that's that those are the key issues that we advocate around in terms of our successes, you've mentioned the reports that we've issued. So we've been issuing annual state of urban safety in South Africa reports since 2016. We are currently working on our fifth report. We've just issued a crime statistics update now, which is another area of advocacy for us, which is to say that it is critical to have evidence-based approaches to crime and violence. What we've realized through our research is that Crime and violence are concentrated in relatively few places in a city. It's, it, the distribution of crime is not across a city. It's not general across a city. So when you identify those hotspots and you tailor your responses to, to the dynamics and things that are happening in that particular hotspot, our deduction is that you can then have a more sustainable impact on the state of crime and violence across um, a city evidence, I, I, I would say, that is aggregated to the city level that starts to give you a clear picture of what's happening at the local level has been one of our successes and one of, 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 of something that I must say that we're quite proud of, that we provide cities with, because um, national crime data tends to distort the true distribution of crime. It just tells you uh, what's happening in terms of what's been reported. And it does so by police station and by police precinct. Um, it doesn't then tell you what's happening in the city of Joburg, what's happening in Cape Town, what's happening um, in PE and so on. And it doesn't tell you what the hotspots are in each of those. So what we have come in to do is provide um, exactly that that level of detail that is at the city level and so on. So I would say that is one of our successes. Secondly, I think um, it hasn't been something that's just generally accepted that crime and violence are about more than just policing. So we've been quite instrumental in, in providing a formalized platform that, that drives this agenda, that drives this need for an integrated approach and for an all of society approach. And, and that represents the interests and, and, and the experiences of practitioners and tries to craft evidence in a way that speaks to the daily experiences of practitioners. And I would say that is also another one of our successes, in addition to the kinds of practices that we've been testing and supporting among our cities. And, and I think we'll get to that later in terms of what are some of the projects um, that we've done. So, so I think um, you'll be very interested to hear uh, of some of the things that we are doing uh, in partnership and in support um, of our cities uh, in, in, 
in seeding a different kind of practice and a more progressive kind of practice and trying to get that to be institutionalized and embedded within cities so it becomes the way things are done. So currently what you're finding is that certain actions are as a result of of inspired individual practitioners connecting with other practitioners, but it's not something that's systemic and something that's embedded in the way that things are done uh, within our institutions and systems. And so that's what we're working towards. While you're on a roll here, let's jump into those, those projects. The government has a responsibility to implement measures that support urban safety. So if you can highlight some of the projects that, that you've been involved with or that you've seen actually government deploying can you just touch on some of those? Yeah, so you're, you're quite right in that um, urban safety is a right. It's enshrined in different instruments, uh, the new urban agenda, the, the sustainable development goals, all of these different things, the integrated urban development framework, which is a policy that governs um, urban development in South Africa, they all speak to urban safety as a key public good in order that you can have cities that are sustainable, productive, um, and, and what have you. And so uh, in recognition of that, we do quite a lot of, of, of learning and exchange and identifying of exemplary practices that can help us to edge to safer cities and to edge to more peaceful um, societies. One of them, as I said, um, safety is about space, economy, and society. So in terms of space, one of our interventions, we have quite a strong um, thematic focus on public space. Um, and that is supporting the work of different cities like Eteguini, which is, which is part of Durban, Eteguini municipality, which also encompasses Durban, um, and the city of Johannesburg, where they have been testing different practices about how do you make parks and public spaces, pavements, and so on, to be vibrant, active spaces that communities feel an ownership of and that communities are custodians of and that meets their social function because space doesn't ex exist for its own sake. It's supposed to drive other ends and other goods as well. So a park should, should, should help children in terms of their cognitive development, physical activity for for everybody in a community and so on. So they don't exist for the sake of, of existing. They have a social function. Um, and so how do you co-create, co-manage park spaces with communities? So the cities of Eteguini and Johannesburg have been working together and collaborating to test different models. So in, in Itawini, for example, um, there's the Congela Park project where the city has been testing a model where they integrate the homeless persons that have been living in the park as the custodians of the park and the people who look after the park and help to identify what the possible safety challenges are there and as co-managers of the park. And they've come together with the business community in that area to kind of drum together a model. So really taking this concept of all of society approaches and applying it at the local level. Similarly, in the city of Johannesburg, um, <clears throat> the city has been testing community engagement models. How do you engage a community around a park space so that you deliver what they want something that meets their needs because the recognition has been that often government deliver services and infrastructure and so on just as a tick box exercise. We, div we delivered a park there, but does it meet the needs of the people who live there? Does it live up to their expectations and so on? So testing community engagement models and to back that up with research, what we do in support of those interventions and collaborations by cities is that we've got a thematic focus on public space and we've just issued, or we are just, we are about to issue a policy brief on public space that starts to 
um, engage on the practical aspects as well as the policy aspects of how how you govern and how you think about and how you deliver public spaces in a way that is sustainable and that works for the communities at the end of of of, of, of that thinking um, similarly we've got we are issuing and we are in the process of developing a small guide a mini how-to guide on community engagements because that's also another um, big aspect that that can really affect the success or failure of an intervention is how you engage the community. Um, how do you engage older persons versus young people? How do you engage in a transitional urban uh, context such as the, the, the Joburg CBD, um, people are in constant movement, um, the, the community doesn't stay the same. So how do you structure community engagement for such a context? Um, how do you, yeah, and so on. And so those are some of the projects and things that we are um, supporting our cities in doing, uh, helping them to connect um, and cross-pollinate exemplary and good practices and also helping them to generate the research so that so that the interventions are evidence-based and as a result become sustainable. I've been hearing a lot of positive stories, positive <laughs> projects, uh, yes. great vibes, but I can imagine it isn't simply smooth sailing. What are some of the key challenges that you are facing with regards to implementing these strategies and implementing these projects and making everyone around the table see the same clear vision? Certainly not smooth sailing, as particularly in something like the subject we're talking about, the subject of urban safety. So I think I mentioned before that for the most part and currently what we're finding is that some of these interventions are driven and succeed uh, just are happening in pockets. So practitioners here partnering up with their counterparts in different departments within the city um, to test something. Um, and what we are working towards is that these are things that become institutionalized and the way and just the way the system works and the way that things are so that it's not it's not a maverick here brave enough to kind of, so you get a lot of challenges in terms of how um, institutions are structured um, um, that, that kind of stand in the way of the level of collaboration needed so that you can work um, in a sustainable and progressive way. So the way that procurement is structured. So for example, if, if I could give you a practical example, if I, I say that today we're having uh, a session to consider the role of planning um, in, in, and how do you incorporate safety thinking within that and you would need to invite practitioners in the same city from the planning department, from the safety department and so on. And what, what the practitioner will first have to look, look at or what they are likely to look at and to assess their ability to attend that session is, is it in my KPA? What are the budget implications? How will I justify the spend if I attend that session? So small practical things like that that just stand in the way of collaboration. And so if that person is really keen to attend and they see the need and they see the importance of this, what will stand in their way is if they're higher up says, but we can't justify that spend, that's not in our KPAs, and we will get into trouble. If, and, and, and those are real considerations, not to say that it's not important for them to think in that way, but this is just by way of me trying to illustrate some of the very basic um, ways that the system works that kind of disable the right kinds of collaboration that are needed so that things can be done um, done in a sustainable way. Other challenges, of course, I think within communities, um, there are some serious uh, uh, challenges with, with respect to crime and violence, gender-based violence. Uh, some cities are highly affected by, by, by gangsterism. And so uh, in terms of 
the budgets and capacities of the municipalities that that are custodians and and that have to to actually act to do something about those those are definitely a challenge so how do you sustainably and practically um, address and challenge uh, attitudes that lead to gender-based violence, for example. How do you, if, if your system and if your institution continues to think and conceive of safety as, as a law enforcement issue, how do you address alcohol as a key driver of, of a lot of crime and violence that happens in communities. It's not enough to merely arrest the perpetrators. There's a lot that happens behind that. There are a lot of attitudes that drive that. Um, and also how do you, like, how do you uh, put in place this consciousness and understanding that you need to be focusing on, on, on reducing the harms related to alcohol um, consumption and do so in a way that's not mainly law enforcement driven. The challenges um, that you see at the community level and also at the institutional level, more broadly, I think you can say that they are systemic. And so how do you have systemic impact so that you can start to see a difference um, in institutions and in communities? So I think that is our preoccupation as, as the Urban Safety Reference Group to say um, it's fine to recognize that there's a connection between things and so on, but how do you drive impact and how do you drive that change? And it's a, it's a very difficult one. It's not easy. It's quite daunting to think um, if you were to make it your responsibility to shift the state of crime and violence um, in South Africa. And it's quite, it's quite, yeah, it's quite a big um, undertaking. So I, I would, in terms of thinking about what the challenges are, I would say those are the challenges. The, the, the issues of crime and violence are a preoccupation of every South African. And whenever we issue our reports, we see that it's quite an emotive um, issue. We get quite a lot of engagement around um, our reports and your everyday South African is always preoccupied with issues of, of violence and crime. The possibility of becoming victim of crime is, is something that is at the forefront um, of our minds. But how do you achieve greater impact? That, that is one of our, our key challenges. With regards to the COVID-19 pandemic and future potential pandemics, has public health safety also now fallen under your urban safety plan or is that a separate case? It's something that we definitely have to think about. I think it's something that has come up as we engage on this issue of public space. How will the how has the pandemic affected the way people engage with public spaces? We're finding that parks have been deserted spaces, for example, so children are not um, there playing and, and, it, and it makes sense that uh, people um, would immediately retreat from public spaces like that. So as we have said that we drive this topic and this theme of, 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 of urban safety as something that is multi-sectoral, as something that requires an integrated approach, public health is a critical component of that. We see that um, as something that is a critical component of, of thinking about safer cities, of driving um, more consciousness around the fact that safety is a cross-cutting area. Although our expertise and that we're not experts in public health, we've seen the need to start to engage with that space and draw them in um, to kind of inform our knowledge generation around issues of public space and, 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 and certainly other themes. So when we say that informal settlements and informal settlement upgrading is a critical um, aspect of driving uh, greater safety, when you think about informal settlements in the context of a pandemic, it becomes even more important to act and to act quickly. Um, and, and you could easily stem or exacerbate um, infections, not only just in thinking about COVID-19, but any other potential 
a virus. Um, there's no telling what kind of virus could come in the future. And so COVID-19 has necessitated that kind of future, uh, futuristic thinking about how do you future-proof uh, different forms of settlements. And it's been a great teacher and a great lesson in the things that have been a blind spot for institutions and, and government um, in thinking about, like you never thought about, you see our cities have been talking about densifying, bringing people closer to opportunities, but how do you densify in a way um, that does not compromise you in the event of, of, an, of, of a virus such as this one. So you have to keep that at the back of your mind as you think about this densification. So of course, there's a need to undo apartheid spatial planning in that it has always kept the poor at the peripheries and away from, 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 from um, opportunities. But in thinking about undoing and rethinking that way of, of, of governing and of thinking and of making space, how do you do so in a way that is safe? Um, in a way, so, so it's important as, as I think it reinforces the point that we've been making that safety is an, inter, is an interdisciplinary um, and, and, and that requires an integrated way of thinking. So in addition to the role of a planner, of a community development practitioner, of an economic development practitioner, you have to think about what, what a public health practitioner could bring um, to thinking um, and, and doing in a more sustainable and integrated way. We've been speaking about the Urban Safety Programme. We spoke about some of the great projects some of the challenges, but now let's give you a time machine and tell you that it's now 2040. What will cities look like? How do you see the urban safety program envisioned in 2040? Mm. Have we solved um, all our challenges? What are your hopes? So I'll, I'll talk about hopes and I'll talk about just the reality of our society and the likelihood of achieving our best hope. So my hope is that in another 40 years, we have had a significant reduction in crime and violence. We have increased um, human well-being in our cities and we've shifted from a very market-based, profit-driven way of looking at cities, their economies, their spaces and created really, and I think COVID-19 is an opportunity to recalibrate and to rethink um, how we include. And so we, uh, my, it is my hope that we have inclusive economies, um, we have undone spatial inequality, and we have more peaceful societies as a result of more inclusive economies, more inclusive spaces. And, um, and that um, everybody is in a position to be able to improve their lot. And so I think currently we say that, and, and there's evidence that backs it up, to say that cities are places of opportunity. I think more than any other place, cities are the best opportunity to improve your lot in life. And it's true, average incomes are higher in the eight or nine larger metros than anywhere else in the country. And so how do we really, really, really leverage that so we include more people, um, we have more sustainable livelihoods, more sustainable incomes, and then you begin to have an impact on the state of violence and crime and you have safer cities, you have more, a more peaceful um, society. So it's my hope that in another 40 years, we've had significant impact using the evidence that we've, we've generated on the state of violence and crime. I think um, South Africa generally as a country is a country of great potential, but that potential is significantly challenged by the state of crime and violence. And if we can um, get that right, um, we can have greater success in every other other aspect yeah in in terms of like I, I i equally have a cynical view we equally depending on the choices we make going forward depending on whether we take on the lessons that have been presented by our current situation of COVID 19 we could equally regress and, and and the situation become worse and it's not something i want to see but 
in being realistic, I would say that our choices today and now um, will significantly determine whether we land on the positive or on the negative side of that. Yeah, I, I don't want to be too cynical, but but I, I think it's very important to, I think this is definitely a moment where we as a country and as a society um, get to decide who we are going to be.